This is the Umbrella Academy on TV Podcast Industries, and we're discussing Umbrella Academy Season 1. Our father never missed an opportunity to remind me that I was ordinary. A hard thing for a little girl to hear. If you're raised to believe nothing about you is special, if the benchmark is extraordinary, what do you do if you're not? Welcome back, fellow Academy alumni. This is TV Podcaster Industries, and we're discussing the Umbrella Academy Season 1. Yes, it's good to be here. You are all special to us. We are all special to you. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to do a quick recap of Season 1 of the Umbrella Academy ahead of Season 2, which launched later this month of July on Netflix. Mm -hmm. I am one of your hosts, Chris. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Hello there, fellow brollies. I am one of your other hosts, John. <laughs> if if people are brollies, what would you be? Polka dots? Would you be striped? I'd be a nice rainbow brolly. Ah, oh, yeah, that's quite cool. That's quite cool. I've always liked the white umbrellas myself. I, I, I'm much more partial to just kind of plain black, you mm. know, that's just, it, it goes with everything. Absolutely. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. yeah John was, yeah. uh, John was giving out while you were doing your intro there, Chris, about my use of, uh, of Academy alumni as, uh, as our fellow watchers for this season or as our listeners for this season, the, uh, the, uh, Academy alumni. Uh, I thought it worked. I, no, I like I, it. I, I, I like it too. I like it too. I think fellow alumni, I think yeah. we could say, okay. but I like fellow brollies. It gives a more wacky edge to it. <laughs> Absolutely. And that is what you are, our wacky edge. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's not get too carried away. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> let's not. Yeah. But if you're joining us for the first time, welcome to TV Podcast Industries, mm-hmm. where we discuss your favorite TV shows in depth each episode as we go through. This is slightly different. We didn't cover season one of the Brella Academy when it came out. We Mm. were covering some other topics at that point. But we are here ahead of the Umbrella Academy season two to give you our thoughts on our rewatch of the Umbrella Academy. But if you haven't joined us before, you can pop over to our website at tvpodcastindustries.com where you can subscribe to us completely across all your favorite Evil Academy, uh, the, the corporation led podcast catchers on any platform. Thank yes, you. we are on Spotify. We're on Google Podcasts. We're over on, I, on Apple Podcasts. That will show you I'm usually using Android because I could not think of the name there for a second, <laughs> but we're uh, anywhere you are. We typically are. If we're not, we're there. Just give us a shout and we'll make sure to try and get our podcast there. Yes, and we're on all fruity podcast catches. <laughs> yes, fruity yes, like Apple. Yeah, I like it. I like it. But you can also join us over on Facebook.com slash group slash TV podcast industries where we and our fellow alumni in this situation, our academy alumni, if you will, where we all discuss, we put up spoiler posts where you can get in depth in any of the favorite shows that we cover. Mm-hmm. Of course, we love hearing your voices on this. And we particularly want to hear your feedback as we go into season two of the Umbrella Academy. So you can go over to our website and leave us a voicemail, or you can send us an email, you know, those old school ones <laughs> at feedback at TV podcast industries dot com. Um, but gentlemen, I think we've given them all the details where they can find us mm-hmm. at waxing lyrical about all their favorite shows. Absolutely. Yeah, we've hit uh, 500 episodes. If this is your first time here in TV Podcast Industries, we have a lot of episodes to go back to. We just did our 500th episode there a couple of weeks ago. Uh, these episodes for Umbrella Academy, because this is sitting in between two series that we're doing, we're going to do them a little bit quicker than we normally would when we get into season two. The episodes themselves, we're going to be reviewing them and we'll have them available a little bit early over on our Patreon group at patreon.com slash TV Podcast Industries. And then we'll release them on our main feed on TV Podcast Industries.com uh, after they've been out on our Patreon feed, so you can support us over there, get access to the episodes a bit early. Um, the way we're going to cover the series uh, for Season 2, when it starts coming out from July 31st, we're going to release Episode number 1, our review of that episode, and then over that weekend, we're going to release Episode 2 and 3, and then we're going to split it up into three episode chunks until the end of the season, so we can close out uh, the full season of Season 2 in Easy to eat chunks, or easy to listen to chunks, let's say. Yeah, you don't eat podcasts, do you? Well, you could. You uh, could. Everything is cake, according to Twitter right now, so <laughs> you can eat anything. Yeah. 
Weird. Um, but we're really looking forward to this. Um, mm-hmm. for, so, gentlemen, before we kind of get into kind of what our thoughts were of season one, why don't we give our listeners a kind of a brief rundown of what what you knew about Umbrella Academy before? Yeah, I was only minorly aware of, uh, of Umbrella Academy, really through Chris. Uh, Chris is a big fan of the comic books originally, and he's the one that told me about the uh, about the comic books uh, before the show came out. I know he was really excited to watch the show when it came out on Netflix and I know myself and John watched the series when it came out, but we had so much other stuff that we were covering on the podcast, we just couldn't fit it in. I did enjoy it the first time around, but I really enjoyed it much more the second viewing, the second time watching it through. Um, I think I watched it over the course of uh, maybe two days or three days this time um, and just really caught the story much better and it kind of sat with me much better because I wasn't watching loads of other things at the same time. I was just <laughs> focused on Umbrella Academy for a couple of days. So uh, I think it's I think it hit much better with me the second time around. Yeah, I, I really, I really loved it. Um, this, this second time around. Uh, first time I liked it as well, but mm-hmm. I think, um, I just wasn't into the rhythm. And I think watching it over two, three days, uh, really, really enjoyed it. And, um, otherwise I actually knew nothing, um, about the Umbrella Academy other than seeing it on the shelves of, uh, my local comic book, Supermarché. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I wouldn't have, known anything about the story so um it was good from that point of view for me uh because yeah just uh getting to to know the story and, and the characters yeah. was was really good so yeah uh, i really enjoyed it um, i love that our american listeners are going to think that if they come to ireland and go to a comic book shop they're looking for a supermarché <laughs> because we're <laughs> so european over here in ireland that we've named them supermarchés um i have also been reading the uh, the umbrella academy recently it's on it's on sale in comicsology at the moment so i got the first three volumes of it, uh, which is pretty much all of the the story i'm about uh, halfway through so i've read the first volume and then half of the second volume so we'll talk a little bit about the differences between the show and the comics i think chris uh, as we go into our discussion uh, but you are kind of the bigger fan of, of umbrella academy you knew this before the show came out right yeah um so i'll, I'll be very kind of upfront i was an emo kid mm-hmm. um i probably still, still am yep <laughs> i'm not even gonna lie uh we so uh jared way who um, is one of the writers on the Umbrella Academy, is also well known for being the front man of My Chemical Romance. I always forget the band, yeah. mate. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> um, and I, I was introduced to, to, to Umbrella Academy from that. Mm-hmm. So I was a fan of the music, and um, I have always been a fan of comics. So when this happened, I was like, oh, this is going to be interesting. Mm-hmm. It's either going to go the way of the dodo or it's going to be quite good. Yeah. Uh, luckily, it's quite good. Mm-hmm. Um, he he seems to have turned his hand to comic books and especially the kind of narrative side quite well. Uh, I've read, I'd say, 99% of all of the Umbrella Academy, uh, the main three volumes, and then the the um, some of those more spin-off ones. Mm-hmm. I know there's a free comic book day one, yeah. a few like that that I probably speed read as a ch- kind of child mm-hmm. and just don't remember. So I'm going to go back to them, similar to you, Comicsology was there, and I went, ooh, I'll take that. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Um, just to kind of bring me back up to speed. And then, yeah, when I heard that Netflix were going to do this, had bought the rights to this, it was one of those, are we going to get a Spider-Man, Japanese Spider-Man or Spider-Man 1970s uh, kind of TV show where they'll maybe turn this into a procedural or <laughs> what's going to happen? Uh-huh. Um, and surprisingly, it wasn't. It, it, we had season one, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Um I will not say it's perfect. None of the shows we cover are perfect, mm-hmm. but uh, each aspect of them um, is usually quite well. And yeah, we'll go into some of the main differences later yeah. between the comics and the, the overall TV show. Yeah. None of the shows we cover are perfect, except for Daredevil Season 1, Watchmen, and uh, Jessica Jones Season 1. That's it, right? That's yeah, the only, yeah, yeah. I think so. <laughs> the only yeah. perfect ones. Um, we're going to do this again slightly differently because we're not going to be covering every individual episode as we go. We're not going to talk about each individual episode. Um, if you do want a podcast that is a great podcast talking about each individual episode, I have to give a plug to my friend Rima's podcast, Strange Indeed, who covered uh, each episode of Umbrella Academy when it came out last year. Uh, but check out Strange Indeed. I've been on the podcast a couple of times actually um, talking about uh, Black Mirror. So 
So um, so check that out as well. But uh, but yeah, Strange Indeed podcast did a really good uh, weekly podcast or episode by episode podcast for Umbrella Academy season one. So go uh, go check that out if you need if you want an extra recap on season one. But the way we're going to do this is we're going to talk through the overall storyline of season one, give you a recap. Some of some of our wonderful listeners I know haven't rewatched the series coming into season two. They just watched it last year and then may not be aware of exactly how the story ends so what we're going to do is john's going to give a bit of a recap we'll talk through it as we go chris feel free to interrupt john as uh, as we all enjoy doing uh, as we go if there's any story points you want to clarify or any things you want to talk around and then we'll talk around overall the story arc for the season yes and please interrupt because this is the mother of all synopses that's because i wrote it. <laughs> you haven't <laughs> synopsized a or summarized i should say mm-hmm. a full season in one go so take a deep breath that is true. I, I'm ge- and... I'm gonna feel like Stephen Fry, to be honest. Uh, sort of reading <laughs> Lord of the Rings here. So okay. uh, settle back, fellow Jack and Ories, uh, and uh, we'll get into the synopsis. Good stuff, John. Would you like to give us the synopsis for Umbrella Academy season one? Sure. Excellent. <laughs> On October 1st, 1989, an inexplicable worldwide event. 43 extraordinary children were spontaneously born by women who had previously shown no signs of pregnancy. Eccentric billionaire inventor Reginald Hargreaves adopted seven of these children. When asked why, his only explanation was to save the world. These seven children form the Umbrella Academy, a dysfunctional family of superheroes with bizarre powers. Their leader, number one, also known as Luther, was fused with ape DNA to save his life. He was sent to the moon alone on a secret mission, but returned to lead when their father died. In very mysterious circumstances. Yes, mm. that, well, that is the big question, isn't it, here, with um, the death of Sir Reggie, is um, <laughs> was he murdered? Yeah. Uh, or did he die of natural causes? Mm. Uh, and of course, the truth lies in a slightly different direction. Yeah. Uh, in that it is, it is a suicide. He killed yeah. himself and lots of uh, different little threads kind of come together yeah. throughout the series, which is quite neat, actually. Absolutely. Um, I like, I like to, to think of this as, as the Coulson from the Avengers where Hargreaves killed himself to make sure that his team came back together and had something to focus on to get them all together. So that's what, that's how I, how I think. But suicide wouldn't really be allowed in the Marvel universe. So they had to get a bad guy to kill Coulson in the Marvel universe to, to uh, push the Avengers together here. Hargreaves kills himself to get his kids to join up for, join forces again. So, um, not sure whether it worked. Well, it did towards the end, but I'm not sure whether he had enough impetus in there to get them all back together. That's part of the function of season one, isn't it, really? They, that the only person that thinks there's foul play or the only person that thinks that something to be investigated is Luther and everybody else kind of yeah. just I, goes, Dad's dead, off we go. I think the great thing is that he did get them back together, but in mm-hmm. their lovely dysfunctional way. Mm. So I, I, that's what I kind of like. They were drawn back to the Academy, um, but then effectively... Uh, kind of just really decided that each one of their brothers and sisters were kind of uh, just as bad as when they left, really. Mm-hmm. And so they kind of went off and did their own thing, sometimes competing against uh, another one of the, the seven um, and sort of all the time with Vanya uh, being um, sort of just kind of put down, really. So, mm-hmm. I, yeah, I, I kind of like that. Yeah, they came together in a dysfunctional way. Exactly. Yeah, they they very much are the the an a different take on what would happen if you literally had Charles Xavier and the X Men, mm-hmm. the original five X Men. You bring them in as teenagers. What will happen yeah. over time? Uh, and this is a, I say grounded in reality, but I meant more a, a realistic take on. Yeah, if you take seven children in mm-hmm. and adopt them and train them to be superheroes this is what will probably happen yeah. in the future yeah exactly exactly john do you want to continue on with our yes on to number two diego a man who can bend his weapons in any direction and uses it to fight crime around the city when his former girlfriend detective patch is murdered the police he once worked with turn on him but diego wants to avenge her death Number three, Alison, has used her ability to make any rumour come true to become a famous actress. But when her husband catches her using her powers to control their child, he files for divorce. Alison returns to the family and reconnects with her previous crush, 
number one. Which is always a weird thing. That is really, yeah. yeah. But I, I get it, they're not blood related, but... Yeah, that is true. And also just because he's called number one, having a, a crush on a previous number one, it's kind of like, um, yeah, she keeps uh, her her toilet uh, stuff as souvenirs. Well, it could at least be worse. Didn't, it could yeah. be a number like, two. Yeah, souvenir. It could, been, it could have been number two. Yeah, that would have been far <laughs> that worse. Is, that is true. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it is a little weird. It, I mean, that's the thing. You constantly have to come back and say, actually, they none of them are related this exactly. is more of as you say chris the the foster family um so it is fine that allison and luther have have got a bit of uh, a thing going on yeah. um and i actually i i think it's quite cute the um their younger selves because there's quite a lot of flashbacks in mm-hmm. this as well yeah. um to that uh you you see that kind of blossoming sort of youthful romance between yeah. the two. It, it kind of, it certainly adds something. I found actually that all these flashbacks really added to the depth of the characters mm-hmm. in, in their adult form. And that was something I really liked about, um, this season one for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and you can see from Harger's reaction, this is absolutely something he does not want. He wants them to treat this whole, idea of the umbrella academy as a business almost as a as an army uh some kind of military force there's no fraternization amongst the troops kind of thing is is his attitude the minute he finds them but i do like just the way it comes back to that you know they had their their kind of pseudo date that got broken up by harb Greaves as kids and then later in life they come back to exactly the same room and have and kind of reenact the date or finish off the date you know i love even just the fact they check the uh the drink cans to make sure they're still in date before drinking them. <laughs> yeah absolutely fun little touches like that that kind of work throughout the season to bring bring those flashbacks really into part of the story we see so often with flashbacks on these shows it's pretty much a guaranteed in netflix show you're going to get a full episode of flashbacks but we see so often that those inform the audience what's happening with the character in the past but don't really sit within the narrative of the show whereas with umbrella academy they're really quite well tied in with what's happening uh, all the way through the series yeah i i did like the awkwardness of luther actually and um, the fact that he has this ape dna so mm. you know you really he, he's got this misproportioned body yeah. where like his, his torso and his arms are just like the incredible hulks in size in the massive yet yeah, his head is quite normal and so are his legs really um, and you see the younger self where he, um, you know, is a, is a sort of a regular proportioned uh, human being. But it, it, I like in that flashback of the romance where they're trying to get back into their little sort of uh, indoor tent that they've created. <laughs> and he's just so huge with his massive broad shoulders uh, and ape arms that it, like it's all just knocking over the place. He's very <laughs> awkward. Um, I kind of like that because I did feel that Luther was one of the the hardest to kind of like in a sense Mm -hmm. and just because of how he he, he's just he's very just sort of focused and driven like he he doesn't really because he's this kind of de facto preordained leader or that's what he's put himself in then it, it does feel like he doesn't really listen to to many people other than Allison, and he's pretty grim with with Vanya, to be honest. Um, yeah. In terms of how he treats her, so uh, like he is a toughie now, along with old Sir Reggie, to to kind of to to get to like yeah. uh, of of the the characters. Yeah, yeah, I'd say so. So two things on number on Luther. One, he was very much supposed to be the Cyclops Captain America. Yeah. So he's the de facto leader who doesn't question, does what he's told. Mm -hmm. And then the Captain America part is very much the, um, Boy Scout Mm -hmm. mentality. So when you mix those two together, you see in Luther this character who is, who doesn't question, follows orders, is a yes sir, yes man. Uh, and this is the downside of this, which is mm-hmm. that he doesn't follow in for his his crush. Ah, okay. Absolutely. So that's why I'm not an Amer- a Captain America fan. <laughs> that's why I prefer that could be it. Yeah. That could Tony be it. Stark. It is. It's okay. the reason why a lot of people don't like Superman as well. It's it's that idea that he's standing up for the rights of everybody, and that doesn't make him that massively interesting of a character. Yeah. Uh, he's he's following orders and he's going along the way. Um, and that's what happens with his belief system. Really falls apart later in the series when he finds out 
to that mission that he was sent to the moon to sit there for four years sending back reports that were never even read when they were returned. You know, that's when his whole system falls apart and you have that kind of moment of him going completely wild on the streets, you know, um, completely changing his personality to fall, to kind of no longer be the leader of this team, you know, so, yeah. uh, so that's his big downfall. But, um, but some interesting ones also just quickly to, to just mention about Alison that, uh, that idea of her, her superpower completely destroying her life because I do think she even says it in a, in a line herself as a character, you know, if any parent had this superpower to be able to tell their children, just go to sleep, dear, you don't need to worry about that anymore. You don't need to keep pressing. Just go to bed and go to sleep. I've heard a rumor that you're tired. And absolutely every parent would use that. But it turns out that this has destroyed her life because her husband probably rightfully realizes if she's going to use it for those little things like getting her child to sleep, she's probably going to use it for other things in the future. And her husband maybe also wonders whether he is in love with her or whether she heard a rumor that he's in love with her. Um, so that, that's not really explored too much, but there is that kind of idea that if you have this proper super ability um, and you use it, then your life could fall apart. So just I kind of like that little background to Alison's character as well. Oh, I love her. Her mm -hmm. her. I would 100% use that. I'm not even a parent and I would still use that. <laughs> I'd be like, I heard you're tired to myself looking in a mirror. Mm -hmm. um, I'll also just kind of one stickler point that I have with Luther, just bringing it back very quickly. Mm -hmm. In the comic books, he, he's not injected with ape DNA. Yeah. In the comic books, he, he essentially, his body dies after a mission. Yeah. And he's, his head is transplanted onto a gorilla's body. Very good. <laughs> um, so he has a gorilla's body in the comic books. Yeah. And that's one of the more fun aspects. And I understand why they did it uh -huh. this way. But can you imagine because they have such an amazing character like Pogo? Mm -hmm. They could have done it. It's just, it was a choice. Yeah. I get it. It was also still a, a stickler point for me where I was like, I want, I, I wanted to see the gorilla body. Mm -hmm. But anywho, moving swiftly on, John, <laughs> do you want to take us on to the, to number four? Ah, yes. Number four. Klaus is plagued by dead people. He sees them all the time. He uses every drug available to him to quell the voices in his head. But when he meets his true love, Dave, on a mistaken excursion back in time to Vietnam, he returns broken hearted. Uh, yes. Poor Klaus. Klaus. Yeah. Um, we are big fans of the actor, uh, Robert yeah. Sheehan, uh, here at TV Podcast Industries. Um, we love him. He's been so good. I think we first came across the character on, on Misfits. Uh, he yep. played pretty much the character. No, of, the person. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. We came across the person, Robert Sheehan, uh, on Misfits. He played, uh, he played a character on there who is very fast talking, very obsessed with drugs and sex. Uh, he's much younger than the Klaus character in this show. Um, but he, every scene that he's in he totally stole the show to the point where basically he left it to become a big actor in, in Hollywood and a big actor in, on other TV shows so um, so Robert Sheehan is is eminently watchable in everything that he's in I definitely say check him out he did a great drama uh, in Ireland as well called Love Hate uh, where he's where just show his dramatic skills check that out as well but he's just been so good and I think in this show again he steals almost every scene that he's in he's absolutely great and I do like that they make him the clown for the first half of the season and then they do have a really interesting side story with him showing his growth when he goes and meets his the man of his dreams Dave uh, in, in Vietnam and he seems a very changed character after that year spent uh, back in history as well so be, it, he's probably the one I'm most intrigued to see how it will change him for season two, I think, is is what's in my head for him. Yeah, I'm right there with you. I love Robert Sheen. Um I'm not a love hate fan. Mm -hmm. I can see why people like it. It's just not a me show. But yes, I I was kind of enthralled by the character in Misfits. Yeah. He is an Irish man through and through. Mm -hmm. There is a season one recap done by himself, number five by uh number three and uh hazel uh -huh. and they his irish comes out oh, of course. oh boy <laughs> he leans into it so hard but it's so good yeah. Yeah. Um, so he does, he does a, a, a kind of generic American accent in this show. And I yeah. think, I think what they get away with, with all of the characters really in the show is all seven of these, these characters are from different corners of the world brought together under one roof. So you can kind of 
excuse them if their accent isn't the perfect American accent, even though they yeah. did grow up in that house, because they would have been pulled from different corners of the world. So it's kind of a, an interesting little way out that they have. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Klaus is, I think, uh, one of my four favorite uh, characters in, in this <laughs> I, I mean, but he is just, I love the irreverence. I love mm-hmm. the wackiness. I love the drug taking that he's doing. Mm-hmm. You know, he's also pretty, uh, put upon by Luther. And I, I think that kind of relationship, you know, his view, because he's, taking all these drugs he's taking the alcohol to to sort of just silence these voices in his head he, he's just not listened to because everything is seen as potentially it's another joke by klaus or he's trying to steal something and uh i think that sort of the the both luther and klaus just sort of banging off one another mm-hmm. it is really good but he, he does also effectively bang off every one of the other academy members and um, but but he does also form i think you know, at least throughout the season, uh, in the early to middle parts, the one he he's the character that has the most empathy with his brothers and sisters. He realizes that they're all completely dysfunctional because he's dysfunctional, and as a result, you know, it, it has a nice moment with Diego, um, and I think because he has his his brother Ben, number six, um, who is there with him in spirit. Um, then, uh, and I know that's slightly jumping ahead in, in the synopsis, but I think, um, you know, he, he really kind of feels like he's the, the heart, uh, of this family mm-hmm. because, um, he's so empathetic because of his, his power to see and commune and, and, uh, I suppose ultimately, um, use dead people i yeah. mean we see the the true extent of his power by episode 10 yeah uh, which it. is really really cool yeah. and and also he goes on this journey uh very up and down to come off the drugs and the alcohol and then he's back on them then come off and then back on them yeah. and certainly and back in time meet the true love and with dave so, drugs, so it's a time. great yeah, yeah. great arc yeah. um i love I, him i love him in the bubble bath <laughs> I love him with sat on the bus with the ghetto. Well, sorry, with the time travel briefcase mm-hmm. um, with just the towel around him. Uh, and he's kind of opening his legs to the lady on the other side of the bus. Uh, <laughs> there's just these really nice touches um, of just cheekiness yeah. from uh, Klaus, which if you see Misfits, you know, Robert Sheehan is absolutely adept at doing that cheeky, mm-hmm. um, sort of naughty, mischievous kind of chap. Yeah, dude. absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Awesome. And I think this time, seeing it a second time, definitely the first time I'm sure I, I had the same observations, but coming back to it, seeing it the second time, I think the realisation that you have with this character is that you kind of like him to begin with and go, yeah, cheeky chappy, he's loving loving the drugs party animal kind of thing but when you realize that moment of kind of episode three or four i think where they show you what his father put him through to make him not afraid of that is true the voices in his head uh, putting him into a crypt and locking him in there for hours on end with these disembodied voices and ghosts screaming <laughs> into his head you kind of realize that this character is <laughs> really pushing himself to the edge because he wants to get away from it. Like it's it's a very serious character yeah. arc that he's going through. You know, he is definitely a heavy drug user and a heavy uh, alcohol user, but it's to block this connection that he has with the other side. Effectively, yeah. so I really I, like that. I think I would have number one and number two myself with that crypt uh, for sure. <laughs> Without a doubt, going from one of your favorite characters to another, John. Uh, yeah. Next up. Is probably the central characters of the story, isn't it? Yes. On with the synopsis. Mm. Uh, number five left before they all got names. He was testing his teleportation powers and got stuck in the future after the world ended. Unable to return, he took a job with the handler as a temporal assassin, traveling through time to kill people through history that will disrupt the timeline. When he breaks free of his mission in order to save the world, the company sends two hitmen, Chacha and Hazel, through time to kill him. Uh, yes. Mm-hmm. Aiden Gallagher, who plays number five, I, I just loved this character and how he brought sort of, so like, he's, he's what? He's, he's about, He's 58. He's 58, Mm -hmm. but he inhabits the body of, what, a 13 or 14-year-old still in Mm -hmm. the school shorts and and the blazer. 
but he has an amazing talent to just bring age to that kid um it, it's just really really good i mean i have no idea how old in real life uh, aiden gallagher is but like if that didn't work or if that wasn't able to work if you just felt you were being talked to by a child um you know without the gravitas that he brings to it mm-hmm. it just would not have worked this is a really important Ca- like sort of casting really yeah. and uh, i loved never seen aiden gallagher in anything before but i just loved the whole feel of his character and uh, i love how he treated his brothers and sisters he's he is kind of the intellectual of um this family he, yeah. he doesn't really give too much credence to kind of the other uh, academy members you know luther is just kind of this physical beast diego is the killer um and you know he he's very um, he's just really, really good. I, mm. I think just his performance alone throughout the whole of this season is just fantastic. Yeah. And uh, I love the fact that he he carries a mannequin uh, around with him, and that's his that's his um, relationship that he's had yeah. uh, through his traveling um, across time uh, and space. Mm-hmm. Uh, that has been his companion. Um, is it's this mannequin? And I love that he brings her back to the the clothes shop that he had got her from uh, in <laughs> from the ruins of the apocalypse, and uh-huh. asks the the lady who's putting the clothes on the rail to kind of get her a new set of clothes and, mm-hmm. and put her up. Uh, and she just likes polka dots. Yeah, yeah <laughs> really, a really nice little touch. Uh, yeah, I, I loved uh, number five. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I number five for me is just fantastic because. It, it's a blink and you'll miss it, but he 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 ages. And when we first see him come through that portal, he ages from the the very old man he is back to the seven year old, ten year old body. Mm. Um, I can't remember the exact age he's yeah. supposed to be, but he, I, think, I think he's twelve. I think they say 12. somewhere that he's about twelve. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's just that kind of what if you were a seventy year old man in that body? Yeah. So he he's the grizzled. He's the world weary adventurer Mm -hmm. time traveler stuck in a kid's body yeah and we we see that in one of the best scenes still in my life when he comes the 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 episode where he goes to get a coffee Mm -hmm. he's just back he's there getting a coffee and he's attacked by the commission um and the company essentially is trying to bring him back into the fold and he we see his teleportation powers in full effect absolutely but you see his teleportations in full effect with the body of a 12 year old Mm -hmm. which is just fantastic he teleports onto the counter to stab a guy in the back of the neck Mm -hmm. and it's just that kind of like it's a mix of puck from like the canadian um x-men alpha Mm, force Force, that small dwarf guy who was quite nimble and then you've also got a bit of nightcrawler in there so nightcrawler just bouncing from one person to the other doing all these things yeah and then you've also got this james bond-esque kind of secret agent gun-toting man Mm -hmm. but just in this kid's body and it's just that it's the same like forever later in the in the series where we see him having coffee over breakfast and he's there sitting, talking to Klaus, like pulls up the kind of chair. Now tell me your problems. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of very dad, granddad thing. And it's just like, yeah, the actor paid, pulls it off amazing it really does and as, as both of you said just the, the show really hangs on this character if he, if he hadn't done as good a job the story kind of would fall apart because it's so important to believe that this is an older person's body but i do love that they have the idea that while he is someone that has lived this life and has all the experience and has more knowledge than everybody else and he's kind of telling it telling all the rest of the members of the academy don't worry when you grow up and get older you'll understand what i believe what i do like about him is that they have he has had a mental break because he's been on his own for the whole time. And that's why he's carrying around the, uh, the mannequin with him the whole yeah. time is because uh, he's got that mental break. But I love the flashes uh, of, of his life as an assassin Definitely. traveling through time. I think that's such a cool story. And to know that he did it for what, 30 years, 38 years, something like that is, is the number that they gave. So he's been traveling back and forth through time, growing older and older 
on these missions until he decides that he's going to leave and and stay finally because he's made it back home to his own time. I, I like um, the fact that cool. the one that um, he the the mission he leaves to come back to the present is to kill the person who's going to assassinate JFK. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just kind of a nice little touch. That's when he figures out the timeline and how to do it, and actually he gets it his calculation slightly wrong, hence why he comes back as um in the child's body. Mm-hmm. Um so I I, I kind of really like that. And I think um there is the the whole um he goes for the coffee and um that's where we get to meet Agnes the donut lady. But he, he does a really kind of sort of just um it's kind of really sarcastic grin to her when she asks, is this your father to, um, a, just a truck, uh, a, a tow truck driver. Um, and then he gets attacked. Uh, and I, I really, I just, I just thought he played it so, mm-hmm. so well. Um, you know, I, and but even as, even as, uh, passing out drunk after drinking the entire <laughs> bottle of vodka, you know, yeah. kids playing drunk, like you can't, you can't really teach that to a 12 year old. But he plays it really well. He plays it like a person who's probably done that once or twice, you know, and you do see moments with him in the future where he says, yeah, I know I drink a lot, uh, where he's, where he, he definitely has drank to excess before in, in the show. And to see this kid pull it off, uh, is, is really good. Like it looks like some people that I've met, uh, heavily drunk uh, after a night on the, on the batter, uh, as we'd say in Ireland. <laughs> I think what's good about his character as well, you know, ultimately his whole storyline is around this impending apocalypse and who is, who needs to be stopped mm-hmm. or how do they need to change it so that the earth isn't sort of, um, sort of destroyed effectively or mankind, um, and, and the world isn't wiped out as, um, as he has, has seen it. And this kind of links slightly with, uh, Sir Reginald Hargreaves, uh, the, the father, um, you know, this explanation to save the world. And there's a lot about whether he knew that something was happening, uh, and, and what would happen to it. And, and we do see an interesting flashback as well with Reginald Hargreaves where he is, um, speaking with his wife in 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 a bed i think she's dying and their race is mm-hmm. leaving their planet so mm-hmm. i'm assuming he's an alien yep. uh, and he uh, you know he arrives in victorian period in, in america and um, and sets up a um and sees an umbrella uh, and you know that's part of the opening um yep. but you know he he is from another world hence all these um, you know, with Pogo, I presume with the android mother, uh, with the DNA being used in Luther, but that he seems to have some premonition or knowledge uh, that this world needs to be saved yeah. in some way. So always kind of linking back to number five, who, uh, you know, to, for the first half of this season is trying to stop this apocalypse on his own the others just don't believe him or you know they're too um worked up around their father's death and certainly luther trying to find out who maybe murdered him um diego is doing his detective work and so he kind of goes off and it's only really by midway through the season that he's really able to get them all on board that something needs to be done because cha-cha and hazel who um you know, these are my, these are uh, my third and fourth favorite. Uh-huh. Um, are are trying to kill him. They attack the academy. You know, the rest of the members don't know who they are, what it's all about. Um, but uh, this, uh, you know, he he is a the main driver here about finding out who they need to yeah. stop. And all they've got is this clue of um, a, a false eye mm-hmm. uh, that he found at the site of the destroyed Academy. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, he, he, he's absolutely central to this uh, and to knowing more about the company uh, and with the handler played by Kate, Kate uh, Walsh. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, he plays off uh, the company uh, and the handler through, through the season to try and find out more. Uh, and in fact, sends word to have Chacha and Hazel kill each other. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I, I thought this was, it was just really a uh, great story. Um, and I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Absolutely. And I, I actually just like the interplay between just those story concepts that we've got there. We've got a guy who's been in the future and knows that the world ended, 
but he doesn't know how it ended. All he has is an eyeball to track down how everything ended. That's his whole mission is, how did it all end? All I've got is this eyeball with a serial number on the back of it. Then we've got these kind of time cops that are being sent back in time to murder him, but have no idea why and aren't given any mission details as to what, as to why it is they're supposed to kill this guy. So I love that everybody's so uninformed as the series begins. And as the series goes on, they eventually start to fill in the the details around uh, their missions and why they're supposed to be doing what they're doing. So I think that's a really good uh, story uh, trick that they have in here, that nobody's really sure what actually happened and what's supposed to happen, but everybody gets there eventually towards the end of the series. So I think that's really a really interesting trick they put in here. Yeah, for me, it was basically putting everyone on equal footing, including the audience. Mm -hmm. So typically in a lot of shows, the characters already know their motivations. Mm -hmm. In here, you the characters don't know the motivations. So yeah. we're on a journey with the characters. And it's one of the reasons I really enjoyed this particular adaptation is because mm -hmm. everyone learned everything at around the same time. There are yeah, some question yeah. marks that like that say we know about number five that other people don't know. Um, mm -hmm. and it does, does do the usual Netflix bit, which is leave us on certain cliffhangers or crazy wacky endings. But majority of the time, uh, things are explained away pretty quickly in the following or preceding episode episodes. Yeah. I mean, even the eyeball actually in the end doesn't amount to much. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it is just by association with, uh, Vonya's, uh, boyfriend um called leopold who ha loses his eye at one stage in this and so everyone's there going it must be his eye exactly. um so it, it's there's quite, kind of a lot of red herrings thrown into this mix yeah. as well and I, I do like that cha cha and hazel or at least certainly hazel through his donut love crush um of both donuts and the lady that serves <laughs> uh him those donuts agnes um kind of ultimately wants to to get out of the company and stop being a hitman mm -hmm. um I, I i he does this really kind of great downtrodden work man who's like you know <laughs> I, I what do we get you know yeah. they used to put us up in nice hotels now we're in we're having to share a room uh in single beds uh in this dumpy kind of motel mm -hmm. um I, I just really liked uh, that and of course I think, uh, any of us that have traveled for work uh, for a long period of time, there are definitely those conversations of, oh, the subsistence has gone down. Oh, my day rate is, is lowered. They're putting me in worse hotels than they used to put me in beforehand. It used to be the fun part of the job was all the extra benefits. Yeah. Now there's no benefits at all. And all I'm getting is pressure to deliver even more than I used to have to deliver. You know, I really like that, that little part of Hazel's character. It's really cool. Definitely. And of course, the, the, the masks that they have are really oh, yeah. nicely iconic and slightly freaky. Yeah. Uh, kind of reminds me a bit of the um the pig air balloon um from the pink floyd oh right okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, just, the inflatable pig yeah that okay. kind of vibe to it i suppose <laughs> but they are iconic they are definitely from the comic books as well they're they're uh, front and center that's how the characters are introduced and i'm not too sure because i'm not there yet but i'm not too sure whether they reveal their faces in the comic book they may at a later stage but it's the masks that are so iconic as they arrive for the first time they're wearing the two masks i love how they did the touch in this of when they uh, burn down one of the buildings, it's the ear of the ma of, of Chacha's mask that's <laughs> left behind, and that's how the police are trying to track them from this ear of uh, of the mask from the future. <laughs> that's quite quite a fun little touch. Uh, let's get back to the synopsis though, because I know uh, there's still a fair bit to cover of the season. Yeah, sure. Number six, Ben, who died mysteriously before the academy broke up, but he is tethered to his ghost whispering brother, Klaus, and doomed to watch him spiral into addiction. I think Ben really adds to Klaus's character, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's great that they have that kind of rapport. You know, we see Klaus being sort of tortured by Hazel and Chacha, um, where first of all he's absolutely loving the torture, dare I say it, which is really funny. Uh, <laughs> and then, um, you know, it starts to get a little serious from Hazel and Chacha, and uh, he begins to to get, um, you know, to see not only Ben but also more people. And you know, I, I, I kind of like the fact that the the spirit of Ben is there, uh, even though we don't know quite how he died, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly. 
um, Ben's power was seemingly to allow uh, octopus sort of limbs to come from his belly and effectively to, uh, yeah, cause a lot of damage and havoc. What's his name in the comic, Chris? I'm not prepared to say that. I'm going to say his name. Oh, okay. Can we not say his name? Yeah, go on. Because <laughs> I don't know. His name is The Horror in the comic, which uh, I just excellent. love. Because it is what would, what would happen when the cops turned up after to catch the bad guys, effectively, that um, that the the Umbrella Academy uh, fought in the, in the bank. You know, I'm sure the first thing they would have said when they walked into that room where the last of those men were dispatched by Ben, I'm sure it would have been, oh my God, the horror. <laughs> because the whole room is just covered in blood, you know. Uh, even in that final episode, that that moment where you have Ben being channeled through Klaus and taking out all of the, the members of, the, of the, the company, I think was just such a cool yeah, moment. Yeah, that was He's very cool. got the coolest superpower, but it obviously got him into some dire straits uh, in, in the past. Yeah, it, it's not just tentacles as well. It, it's basically a, a, his stomach, or he is a portal to extra dimensional horror kind of dimensions where okay. everything that can makes come out. more sense. And mm-hmm. in in this adaptation, it is kind of seen as just uh, Japanese tentacle porn, kind of yeah. wet dream. It's just <laughs> it's just coming all out of him and destroying everything. Um, yeah. I do like how they first kind of suggest it is because in that bank scene where they go ben it's your turn or sorry number six is your turn and he's like do i have to, I have to and exactly. then he go in and it's just like close the door and just blood splattering everywhere mm-hmm. and people screaming it's just a fun way because when all the rest of them are kind of marched outside by reginald mm-hmm. he's there covered in blood Exactly. Yes. <laughs> how the rest great, of great little touch. Yeah. yeah. Ben is the character that we see least, obviously, in the show. He's uh, he's uh, someone that we see as kind of. It's almost like Clay's sponsor, um, being there at all times when Clay is getting worse yeah. and worse in the drugs. You have him talking in the background, going, "Maybe you should give this up, mate." You know, uh, which I think is a nice touch for it is. for Ben's character. Nice and a really helpful for Clay's character to see what he's going through. And I'm really hopeful with the way the season ended with uh, Klaus channeling Ben through him that that means we're going to see a lot more of Ben in season two I'm hoping yeah for. absolutely I like that actually that idea that it Ben is also Klaus's sponsor I hadn't really thought of it like that but it absolutely is yeah. um and that's a really great way of describing it um which I really like as well because I, I think the two of them work really uh nicely together and yeah. of course through just um having Ben there uh, there's almost this realization of what Klaus can actually do when he's not on narcotics or alcohol. And mm-hmm. um, that, you know, he's able to play pat a cake with, um, w- with Ben at one stage <laughs> yeah. uh, and then ultimately leading to, uh, Klaus being able to, as you say, uh, sort of use Ben through his power of being able to, um, uh, talk and uh use dead people uh in in the real world mm-hmm. so uh yeah that's it, a cool. it's a really good kind of little relationship throughout this whole season very cool very cool but from speaking of people with powers to someone without mm. yes on to number seven also known as vanya who isn't special, not special at all, only she's the most powerful of the group. Mm -hmm. When Professor Hargreaves discovers how powerful she is, he forces Alison to hide Vanya's powers from her completely. When Vanya meets Leopold Peabody, she finally learns to believe in herself and finds out all about her powers. She can channel sound into powerful shockwaves. But Leopold's motives are his own. He was born on the same day as the Seven, but had no powers, and an abusive father who pushed him to patricide. When confronted by the team, Vanya lashes out at her sister, slitting her vocal cords and removing her ability to influence anyone else ever again. But when Vanya learns of Leopold's plot, she destroys him for his betrayal and hunts down the rest of her family and destroys their home, the Academy. Mm, lots of destruction from yes. Vanya when she, when she learns her powers. I, I, I really love that part of the story. I think Ellen Page was probably the most recognisable actress uh, yeah. in this show. She really was the centre poster. Well, and Pogo, think, Pogo. But- Come on, he was the Planet of the Apes, Planet of the Apes 2, 3, like, yeah. st- started alongside Charlton Heston, just putting that out there. Yeah, he was he was in, in uh, quite a lot of big things before. But no, Ellen Page really was the headline actress in the show. And I'm sure everybody could have guessed there was something about her. But for those first three or four episodes where everybody's going, 
you're a loser, you're useless, you have ah, nothing yeah. special about you. You're like, Ellen Page, why did she take this role to just sit and play violin and sometimes play violin badly because everybody's telling her, you're not very good at that, you should give it up, you know? Yeah. I think, oh, is there something going to happen here? But to realize she is the most powerful of the Umbrella Academy and her father did something as as horrible as he did by forcing that memory down deep inside her by uh, by using one of the other kids' powers is is a really good twist on the story. I think. A- absolutely. I mean, I think Vanya's arc actually, you know, it is um, it's deeply connected in with number five um, around the apocalypse because ultimately she is that vehicle for um, the apocalypse and and the arc. You know, I think probably by about two thirds of the way through, that's when I was starting to think, oh, is it Vanya? Um, as I say, there's a lot of red herrings, which is quite kind of yeah. nice. I think, um, but and it's simple, but I thought it it really worked. I thought it was really neat, um, and I just liked how, um, again, just this dysfunctional family drama. To be honest, uh, between all these different yeah. members of the Umbrella Academy, um, these foster brothers and sisters, just how they really just played against one another all the time. And I, I really felt sorry for Vanya because, you know, all the decisions or choices made by the the rest of the family, or even just calling a family meeting, you know, to interact with her just seemed pretty bad. I mean, even Alison, who tries the most, um, it just still felt like it came out the wrong way. I was kind of getting frustrated with all the other family members <laughs> going, why can you not speak to her like a, a, a human being? Uh-huh. Um, and uh, you just really felt sorry uh, for, for, for Vanya. Um, and then you see what her, her dad did. And, you know, for, for, for better or for worse about it, you know, sh- she her powers kind of sort of turn evil uh, for want of a better description. Mm. I don't think inherently she's not because you see it in the remorse uh, that she has when she lashes out at Alison and uh, cutting her vocal cords. Mm. And even though that's done out of place of um, almost frustration for herself, that yeah. no one is listening to her. No one is believing her. She's been treated like this, like three year old still. She's still deeply distraught by what's happened. But again, it, it's like her, she, it's almost like she has anger management issues, I oh, think. Without um, a doubt. And that's, like, I know, that's I know, the problem. Like, I know you're saying that she regrets what she did to Alison, but it doesn't stop her killing Pogo, who's been massively supportive for her just because he knew exactly. about it, uh, the next in the next episode. Have to say, brilliant touch. Uh, and use of flashbacks in episode nine where she's walking through the academy and we we follow along with her is episode nine or ten uh, where she's walking through the academy and seeing flashbacks to everybody every member of uh, of the umbrella academy and their versions of telling her she's useless uh, as she explodes each of their rooms in the house eventually taking down yeah the academy that was itself. nice that was such a great use like we've kind of joked uh, many times about netflix's use of back uh, use of flashbacks in a show um and to tie it in so well as i mentioned earlier on to tie it in so well to the show itself uh, in in that way towards in episode nine or ten i think was just so good yeah. Oh, like the, the, the prison scenes in this are just chilling. Like when the, the, the scene before she breaks, just before she explodes the prison and mm-hmm. where you see, as you said, the, those flashbacks and the revelation of that rumored used her mm-hmm. rumor powers on her own sister. The whole thing for me on this is it is a bit of a family drama, but it's this really dark take on it. Hmm. Uh, in that, as you said, so like we've all we've all had that moment where you, with your sibling where you're like, oh, you're just so annoying, or you've all said something quite mean in the heat of a moment yeah. to your sibling. <laughs> that would have probably been the mildest, Chris. <laughs> yeah, and then just but like that, these flashbacks. Like, if you were able to remember each specific detail of that, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, for me, when she takes down Pogo, I just I yeah. That was a moment where I went, does she ever come back from that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's but, a question you will always ask. Yeah. That, that, I mean, that was pretty brutal, but it, it, it is also, um, you know, when Alison's coming into the concert hall, cause she's playing this concert and as her powers develop, as she's playing this, this music, you can see her, she's getting whiter and whiter. It's like this white heat developing this, um, kind of really powerful energy uh building up in her 
Um, and but she sees Alison and she smiles. They both have that connection. But unfortunately, again, the rest of the family have decided to ignore Alison yep. and try and her Let sort her. of sort of attack her flanks to try and uh-huh. stop her. So to stop her playing the music where she's drawing her power from. And, uh, you know, and then it all kind of goes south pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think maybe with that, I should move on to our final bit of the synopsis. Well, yeah, just uh, we, we close out the season <laughs> with the with the end of the synopsis. Yeah, I think that's the way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And so as the team tracks Vanya down, assassins Hazel and Chacha end their relationship. Hazel runs off with his donut dealing girlfriend, Agnes, and Diego confronted Chacha for murdering Inspector Patch. Diego lets her live, but it might not be a long life. The siblings end Vanya's cataclysmic performance by knocking her out, but Vanya's destructive force is deflected at the moon, sending meteors back to destroy Earth, creating the apocalypse they've been trying to prevent. With nothing left to do, Number 5 uses his time travel powers to pull the entire family out of time and avoid the apocalypse. So yeah, they don't actually stop the apocalypse. It's they intense. just do a quick shimmy to the left mm-hmm. to to dodge it, um, which yeah. is interesting. I kind of like the joke of that. Like it's, yeah. it's kind of a well, either we could stay here and all die, or else we could uh, use your powers and jump out of here. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> yeah, go exactly. You know? um, so and and also Hazel with Agnes also manages. Uh, to escape um i think i don't know might be wrong mm. but it looks like he has managed to get hold of one of the few remaining time travel briefcases right. from the handler who he has shot previously because mm-hmm. uh, she was ho- he was holding um agnes um as hostage uh, for hazel and cha-cha to go and protect vanya take down the rest of the academy the so handler was she was yeah, yeah so i i think he's t- got her briefcase time mm-hmm. travel briefcase and have uh has sort of time traveled out of there as well other than the rest of the world i think it is <laughs> cha-cha yeah. that i don't really know about because she was still in the theater mm-hmm. um and we don't know what's happened to her i don't think she escaped but maybe she had something up her sleeve she leaves the theater and we last see her on a payphone um, trying to call right. the commission to try and pick her up and they don't answer. Mm-hmm. And yeah. then we see the, the street enveloped with flames. Exactly. Um, so I do believe this is the end of Mary J. Blige. Yes. I don't know. Yeah, it's, that's really sad because she was so good in the show. She really, yeah, really she was really good. But you never know a time travel plot. We've seen it so much in, in Star Trek. We've seen it so much in so many other shows. So once time travel is involved, where did they jump to? Did they jump before the whole world was destroyed? So, you know, again, Chacha is destroyed as the entire rest of the world was destroyed. So it's very unlikely that they've just jumped forward in five minutes and the whole planet is gone. <laughs> so I presume they've gone back to a time before, uh, before Chacha died. Uh, so I, I think that's it. Again. They're, they're pragmatic that they just decided we need to fight another day. Mm-hmm. Whereas Captain America would have been stoic and probably just gotten turn to dust nah he would have found a way out, definitely <laughs> um what did you think of this so the, uh, just the end of that story let's let's uh let's close this out what did you think of how this moment ended were you were you uh surprised yeah well, let me say i was surprised yeah without, i was surprised without uh, just asking you guys the question i was very surprised by this thing of the uh, rebounding of the power from vanya uh, smacking off the moon and i love that i think it's five is it that turns around and or is it klaus that turns around and looks up and goes uh oh klaus, <laughs> as yeah. pieces of, yeah pieces of the moon start to crack off and come back to the earth i think it's a a really interesting touch to close out the season on this massive cliffhanger but uh but i thought it was very funny and really surprising to see uh that they didn't save the yeah the absolutely the so. yeah i i think that was another sort of great thing for me from mm. this was that they didn't just save the day they couldn't and yeah. um, because yeah. time was against them mm-hmm. uh, as well as their sister and they have to live to fight another day so i i don't know I, i've not read the comics so I, I don't know what season two will bring as mm-hmm. to whether that is going to be them still trying to find a way to prevent that apocalypse so that the rest of the world can live and not just um the the seven of them the seven, yeah. and uh hazel and mm-hmm. agnes and the 
the commission. There seems to be quite a lot of people in the commission as mm-hmm. well. Um, so yeah, it'd be interesting or, or whether maybe something like that, sorry, the company, not the commission, yeah. or whether there's something that that's resolved relatively quickly and there's new areas that they're exploring. But, um, as I say, there's, there's obviously this alien planet anyway where Reginald Hargreaves has come from. So mm-hmm. there's, you know, th- there's these whole touches that the, the universe that the Umbrella Academy I- is in has, is much bigger with the company and with the time travel and with the, the alien planets. Yeah, absolutely. This completely took me surprise because it is different from the comic books. Yeah. It's a lot different. So Uh, in the comic books, and I know we'll we'll discuss it, the differences later. Um, but for me, this, I was not expecting this. This, I was expecting it to be wrapped up. And what I find even more shocking was that they did not know they were going to get a second season on this. Mm -hmm. So it's ballsy to kind of go, do you know what? We're not going to save the universe. We're going to mm-hmm. live to fight another day and we're going to destroy the world. And fingers crossed, we get a second season. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's, it's, yeah, it's ballsy. Like <laughs> that's the best way of putting it. It's just like, yeah. it's kind of like the, the writers here just went, you know what? Here you go. Whoa, boom. We're yeah. going to put our big comic. Uh, tentacle out onto the table and go, we're going to leave it like this and mm-hmm. people are going to want a second season. Exactly, exactly. What do you, how do you feel about that, Chris? Because I know you've, that's something that we, when we talk about episode by episode on shows that aren't confirmed for a second season, this is something that's been a little bit of a bugbear for you on other shows before. So obviously knowing that in two weeks' time we're going to get the second season, that's awesome. But what did you think when you saw the first season? Were you going, oh, please just give me one more episode? Or I was, were you annoyed oh, by please it? give me one more episode. <laughs> I was yeah. so annoyed because there was no wrap-up. Yeah. So we don't know. Now, unfortunately, I do know that they've survived and where they go because I've seen the trailer for season two um, mm-hmm. was before as we record this. But I was at that point going, wait, are they just really going to leave it like that? And it's been a while. So it's been a it's been a hot minute since we got announced that they were doing a season two. Yeah, uh, it took not. It's not like a normal TV show where they they announce. Yeah, we're 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 scripting for season two straight away. So yeah. there was a potentially a point where this was not going to happen. And for me, I was like, "But you you're veering out of the what I know." So I you you now have my interest. Yeah, you cannot do that to me. Um, <laughs> so, well, they can. Oh, but they can. No, but they can. Yeah. They did. <laughs> um, we've closed out our synopsis for season one overall. That was, that was a good detailed kind of where everybody ended and where everybody started and, uh, and their overall. What did you think of the arc? Is there anything else you guys want to say about the overall arc of the first season? Anything about the storyline and how it was delivered that you wanted to talk about? I'll, I'll take a very quick one here. Um, so personally, I liked what they did. So, this is an ad- adaptation on, uh, essentially, we'll go into it, but essentially two comic books kind of melded slightly into one. Mm. And those comic books were 10 issues combined. I think maybe 11 when you take some of the kind of side stories, 11, 12 when you take some of the side stories that were put in as well. So they took a very small kind of source material and mm. fleshed out some of these additional areas. Um, and... W- what I really enjoyed was this, that, that grounding in, grounding quote unquote in reality with people with superpowers, but that more grounded piece. And then these extensions, for example, best example, Hazel and Chacha. They were, n- they, they are slightly two dimensional characters in the comic books. And I mean mm-hmm. two dimensional in the, the writing and <laughs> not character. actually just on a page. Um, but, what they did here with these two characters in the TV show was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. they really made them their own. And to see what happens to Hazel at the end, yeah. to see that arc of a character growth, to mm-hmm. see what happens to Chacha, it's just, I was so happy with it. And yeah. it was one, I do hope that Chacha survives because mm-hmm. I do really enjoy the, the interplay between a lot of these characters. Absolutely. Um, the death of the handler 
for me was um, mm-hmm. a, a very strange one because I did feel that the actress um, Kate Walsh mm-hmm. was is just fantastic. She was great. She was great. Most people will recognize her from Grey's Anatomy, probably. She's also in a lot of other shows. She's um, lends her voice in a lot of shows as well. Right. I still, growing up in a household full of women, uh, mm-hmm. and Grey's Anatomy being a central pillar, similar to <laughs> Sex and the City at a time, where right. it was on once a week and you'd tune in. Mm-hmm. I'm used to seeing her as that character. Right. And this complete change... Obviously, an actress is can act as a different person. Who knew? Yeah, it's, a shocker. <laughs> uh, it's a shock. But seeing her like this was just fantastic. It yeah, was, yeah it was, she's really, she's really a good. Yeah, a real, a real surprising uh, or a real kind of cool death for Hazel to actually be able to murder someone uh, and be able to take out the handler and get the get the uh, ability to time travel with his uh, with his new girlfriend. You know, I think that's a that's a cool way of doing it. So you give a little bit more. Uh, action to a character like Hazel, as you say, a little bit two dimensional in the in the comic books. But John, any additional overall thoughts on the arc for season yeah, one? Yeah. Um I I really liked it. I thought it was really fresh. Um I I I would kind of describe it as a dysfunctional family drama that's wrapped up in saving the world from the apocalypse, but not doing a very good job of it, mm-hmm. wrapped up in the realization that the abused child and sister is suddenly realizing her potential to cause said apocalypse mm-hmm. um, with a few red herrings thrown in to keep the guesswork going. I mean, and I think that's what I liked. I, li- I liked the fact that number five's arc coupled with Vanya's arc uh, coupled with this um, this academy of seven, um, some of them dead, some of them ignored, some of them going off in their own directions um, with this background of a really awful foster father in Sir Reginald. Mm. Um, we're all trying to do things and none of them teamed up until it really mattered. Um, and it it felt really good. I, I really liked it. It To me, it's one of those um, how it feeling real and just different but they kind of still get the job done in that at least they're still alive even if another seven billion people aren't <laughs> uh, so i, I kind of like that yeah. it's it's crazy mm-hmm. so i i liked it i liked it a lot the story um for sure um i liked how it all came together yeah uh, one additional final call out for me is the music Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I don't know how we got to this point and not mention it. I know. Like, it's like, usually we talk about the, the musics and not even just in this case, the, uh, the, the licensed music, but even the orchestral bits mm-hmm. that they, they put in. So the, the made four, uh, were just fantastic. Yeah. There's a lot of, um, a lot of great rock versions of Bach in there that were very cool. That's, uh, that Vanya plays on her rock violin, as I keep calling it when I was looking for our theme tune for the show. Um, but even just reading the episode titles, I think it, the comics makes, does this as well. The kind of titles for each of the, uh, sections of the comic book. I think a lot of them are taken from songs. Yeah. Uh, and similar in this show that a lot of the titles for the episodes are, are from, uh, are from songs. And instantly when I see episode two's title, Run Boy Run, I'm instantly singing the song that started the episode showing number five in the future running away from everything that was going on or jumping to the future, sorry. Uh, I think there's such a great visual style tied up in the songs that are chosen for the show. And I'm sure Jared Way being involved in the show allowed allowed them a bit more access to some different acts and different music that may not have been on other Netflix shows before as well. So uh, Netflix do have a, a good bit of pull with the with where they get their music from, as we saw from from Luke Cage. But I'm sure with Jared Way and the style of the comic, I'm, I'm sure that had a little influence on uh, the artists that were being chosen for the music as well. So totally great call out there, Chris. Thank you. Music, definitely. For me, it was just the two standout moments is Istanbul, not constant Constantinople yeah, always yes. gets me, but uh, also the 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 uh, scene that everyone giants. remembers from it. Specifically, I think we're alone now. Uh, that that scene where they're all dancing in their individual rooms, and the, yeah. the choice to pull back out and show them out together but apart, and mm-hmm. this kind of very tender yeah. moment. And it's almost like a dollhouse, yeah, kind of exactly. Thing where everybody everybody's in their own individual room dancing by themselves but kind of in the memory of of themselves as kids yeah. kind of thing i think they use that again for the 
uh, announcement trailer for season two of Umbrella Academy that had each of the uh, each of the actors doing it from their own homes on their own video cameras, uh, doing it again uh, and putting it, piecing it all together to reveal uh, when the show was coming back for season two. So uh, everybody loves that scene. It's it, yeah. was, it was excellent and really beautifully put together. Definitely, yeah. yeah. Yeah, music is classic. Really, really good choices for that season of uh, season one of the show. Yeah, really, really good. Yeah, but gentlemen, I think it's about time now that we've discussed the season. We've discussed kind of what we liked, the overall arcs. Is there any one character you just want to do a quick call out on, a shout shout out on, before we move over to kind <laughs> or of or any seven characters of the seven characters? Do you want to call? Yeah, I, <laughs> I, no, I think. Look, I, I've, I've said the the four characters I really kind of enjoyed here, mm-hmm. and I think in their own ways i i thought this was a really good character driven story because being a dysfunctional family it requires all those characters to sort of bounce off one another yeah. uh, and rub one another uh up the wrong way but i mean for me it was um number five and klaus mm-hmm. absolutely uh from the academy i i just love the these two characters and what they brought i think the great depth uh here and then it was Hazel and Cha Cha, um, as these two, uh, these two assassins coming after number five, um, and, and just their kind of tit for tat. Um, Cha Cha was, let's get this job done. Hazel starting to have a few doubts about the benefits from the employer. Uh, and then ultimately through his love of, uh, donuts, finding the love of his life who, then persuades him to, um, you know, take up bird watching instead <laughs> and, uh, to, to, to move, uh, from and hand his resignation effectively yeah. into the company. You know, and they were equal to the seven of the academy. I think one of the great things I loved about them coming into the Umbrella Academy and having that fight was that they did kick ass. Mm-hmm. Um, he, despite the, the power of Luther, um, and Allison and everyone else there, you know, they came in and they held their own. Yeah, they got a bit of a um, a, f- a few uh, bruises and, and scrapes, but I, I like the fact that they weren't um, just assassins to be killed off themselves pretty easily. I liked the the challenge that number five brought to them, but they realized that they were pretty damn good yeah. and, and could do this. So well, they did get uh, they, kidnapped one of yeah. the one so of the So great academies. great yeah. characters yeah. for almost kind of uh, you know secondary tier. I, I loved uh the two of them. Yeah. Yeah. Any other colleague colleagues, Chris? Uh for me it's just Mum and Pogo. Uh, mm. they're supporting characters but yeah. they make such a an impact in this. In as John said, it's a character centric, character led um, TV show. Mm-hmm. For me, this was just you needed these two characters. You needed the mother character, yeah. and the way they they played her and the way that they they expanded upon who she is and what she does. But also the way that they expanded upon Pogo. I I was. When I had first heard about this show, I was pretty sure they were not going to have the chimpanzee assistant, Butler. Mm-hmm. Like, I thought, no, it, it, like, we had heard they were trying to ground it a bit more in reality. They right. would, they would not be going to the Eiffel Tower, which is a spaceship and things like that. But they still kind of kept it to this character. And beyond that, they, they made it, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the, I'm just pulling up the name of the actor who voiced it. It was, uh, Anne Godley. Yeah. Um, he did such an amazing bit of doing that aged man, like that, mm-hmm. that Alfred character that I've seen this all before. I've done it. Yeah. I'm here to help you, Master Wayne. You know, like I just mm-hmm. And it was just that the way that they did pull it together. So yeah. for me, yeah. it was just that is pour one out for homie type thing. Because we lost Pogo at the end we of the did. series. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. He's done by Weta Digital as well, isn't he? Same, yes. same company that did uh, Planet of the Apes, um, the, the the wonderful remakes of the, of the Planet of the Apes. Um, so... That's why it's such a good character, but it's also an amalgamation of two characters from the comic books. There is a, a right hand man of, uh, of 
Hargreaves in the in the house in uh, the academy, and there's also Pogo, and I think the two of them been am- amalgamated together to kind of lead the family yeah. as well. So, uh, so that's quite an interesting touch. Uh, we also lost Mom, we, which we didn't even mention. Sorry, yes. um, we see her. Yeah, we see her standing at uh, at the window as the as the academy collapses, and nobody's able to go in and save her. Um, so, will we see her back in season two? That's my question. Mm. The, 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 I I do believe. That they'll need a mum character in this, Maybe, yeah. uh, in in season two. But at the same point, where are they in season two? So, if they are forward in time, maybe not. Yeah. If they're backwards in time. Almost definitely. Um, <laughs> almost, yes, definitely. almost definitely. Everybody that died it. towards the end of the season will be back if yes. they're able to jump back in time. They're probably not going to jump back to just after mom died. They're probably going to jump back to before that, right? And <laughs> save her. <laughs> well, they have to save the world. Yeah. So they need to do it. And it's like, do we go five minutes before? Yeah. No, let's just do at least five hours. Give yourself a bit of yeah. breathing room. And maybe number five is the guider here. So they only had eight days to stop the apocalypse, and that clearly wasn't enough. So maybe they need 20 days to do it, you know, <laughs> jump back three or four weeks, something like that. Maybe that maybe that's the way to do it. Um, yeah, no, I'm I'm a big fan of of those characters, particularly of of uh, of the ones that you guys are mentioned, and definitely the uh, the seven themselves are really well cast. Everybody has some really good moments in the series. I think that's one of the uh, the big positives I would give for the show is that each character has a really good storyline behind them. You may not find out all about it in season one. Even characters like Diego has a really good story underneath uh, what's going on and why. Uh, he gets to his end point where the the person who's killed the woman he loved, he doesn't kill her, even though that's been what's behind him throughout the season has been this idea that he is a, a, a vigilante, effectively, who will use violence to kill the people that are doing bad things. But even though he realizes that's not what Detective Patch would have wanted for him to murder the person that that killed her. So I, I like that he has he has an arc. Every, every character has an arc in the show and there's enough there to play with for season two about what's going to happen with those characters. Yeah, I, I think so. Any other characters that's, that stand out that we haven't really talked about uh, for this section before we move on? No, not at all. Grant. Yeah, no, that's about it. So let's move forward very quickly just into mm. a very brief discussion about the differences. Yeah. So I, we've mentioned quite a lot here and there throughout this episode. But I just want to, uh, for our listeners, if you have Comixology, if you do enjoy reading comics, um, and even if you don't, if you just kind of want to check out the background of what was made into season one. Mm-hmm. So this first season is made up of very much two two of the books. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's made up of Apocalypse Suite. And Dallas. Yes. Those are the two first books in the, the series. And, uh, it, it takes some liberties with both of them, but very much just kind of jams together, but in a cohesive way. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say so. The, the books are written by Jared Way, as Chris mentioned, and drawn by Gabriel Ba. Um, and it feels like one of those projects that I think the, the intro is written by, uh, Gabriel Ba, the artist, uh, talking about why he wanted to work with Jared Way. And, uh, it feels like the reason why he actually did want to work with them is because he's given great license to use all the artwork. <laughs> you know, he's really able to put his stamp on each one of the characters. Um, I think myself and Chris were talking about this at the only day that we've actually met face to face since, uh, since our own little apocalypse yeah. happened back in February. Uh, we were having a bit, bit of a chat about the comic books because it was my first time reading them uh, as I went through the second series. And I kind of felt like. I know it's, I know comics have to build up into, uh, developing their stories and developing their characters, but these people are people with superpowers. Here's their superpower rather than these are characters, which came as a bit of a surprise to me because season one of the Netflix show is much more about this is the character. This is what their personality yeah. is. And they also have superpowers, but they don't use them anymore because they're no longer an academy. So I think. For anybody who'd read the comics going into the show, I could see them being marginally or maybe just surprised or disappointed by there being such a lack of superpowers in the show uh, for a lot of the season. Um, I think the flashback that happens with the kids, as we mentioned earlier on, in the bank, uh, taking care of the bank robbers, is a great use of each of the the powers that they have. And I think most of volume one of the uh, of the comic book is the powers being used over and over again in flashbacks and in the storytelling. So it seemed like a real surprise that they went, we're going to use that in episode one and then not use it again until episode six, other than yeah. the time travel powers. But, you know, Rumor, for example, is a, a really interesting character uh, to use her powers to just whisper something in an ear. We've covered 
covered an entire series about a character who whispers in people's ears and gets them to do things that she wants in Penny Dreadful City of Angels. That's pretty much the whole premise of that entire show. Whereas here, Rumor actually doesn't use her powers very often at all. Um, there's one really cool uh, short story that Jared Way wrote about the character of Rumor where she turns up to a dead body, which is her own body because she effectively rumored into existence another version of herself because she said she was at the library to her father to get out of punishment and that willed into an exist into existence another version of herself which is a cool way of going she's really powerful like this idea of being able to whisper into people's ears or tell them a rumor is such and such a thing actually brings it and makes it true that suddenly makes it massively more powerful than what you think is happening on the show um so i'm sure that may be something they'll pull into season two or season three if they want to show them using their powers more yeah so that's one of the thing they they have simplified the powers mm. slightly um across all of the guys mm. so as i said so like luther uh they lost his body and was repl- his head is transplanted onto that of a gorilla. Yeah. Um, Alison in the comic books bends reality to her will through right. rumors. Right. Whereas in this, it's more the, the will and the emotions of the people mm-hmm. that she rumors. Uh, Klaus, for example, like they pretty much bring it down to he is just talks with the dead and yeah. can manifest the dead. Yeah, he had hardly any character in the comic book, it felt like. Um, until in the comic book, yeah. he's he, he's like a really strong telekinetic. Um, like he's uh, a... No, I'm not going to... It's not going to ruin it. But in, in the comic book, he single-handedly stops a large chunk of the moon uh, with his own powers. Well, yeah. It, uh, that might spoil something in season two, actually, if the moon is about to fall to Earth. But, uh, but you never know. <laughs> they may well, not, we saw the moon falling to Earth anyway yeah. in season one. Yeah. But uh, they, they removed his powers. Uh, to, and the question is... I, 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 the, a question I have also is, did they? That is the thing. We see that he's opening up his powers on this. Mm-hmm. So what I, I'm hoping is that similar to the way that we discussed that the, the way that the show was built is that we as a viewer went on the journey with the actual characters in terms of learning the ins and outs of what was happening. This could also be the same with the characters' powers. Yeah. So as they are now learning uh, and using their powers more, mm. we may see them kind of evolve in season two. And I think since we're talking about the comparison to the comics, I think that's the big surprise because in the comics, they all seem f- fully able to use their powers. <laughs> and, yes. Uh, that's where you start off. And it does seem like the way that they've approached it as a writer and an artist together doing the books, it really feels like they're going, we sh- can show you all these massively powerful characters. And that's their that's their way of putting it together and not really focusing on the story of the central relationship between all these uh, all these super beings trapped under one roof uh, by a ruthless father. There's a little bit of that yeah. story. I am very glad they changed Vanya's character uh, for the TV yeah. show. She's so much more sympathetic. Play Bell and Page because she's such a great actress, probably is able to draw out your sympathy for her as a character. But in the comics, she's really petulant. She is left alone by the rest of them exactly the same way and is told that she has no powers at all. But I felt no connection with the character at all. And then when she's turned into the living violin, um, which is basically what she is at the end of the series, this idea that she's able to use the power of music and the power of reverberations as a really strong, powerful weapon in the comic books. Um, what would be the say? What would be the way? I can't imagine how you would bring that to life. Um, yeah, I'm glad they made it much more palatable to an average viewer of Netflix to just have it that she has a white suit rather than being painted white and having the grooves of a of a violin uh, embedded on her and the strings tattooed across her body to make her look like a violin. I just was kind yeah. of thinking that's this looks a little bit ridiculous uh, if you try to translate it directly. So I think they did a really good job of adapting this into something very fairly different from the comic book and keeping the essence of the main characters, I suppose. I, I also like the way that in the comic books they had number five shooter. Like they number five shoots her in the head mm-hmm. to the point where he paralyzes her going forward. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like how Allison is the one to doesn't shoot her in the head, like basically distracts her by shooting beside her ear and like kind of basically deafening her 
so she can't hear anything. Yeah, one illusion that I think they might have put in there to that uh, that. Para- paralysis of Vanya. Uh, I, there is a moment in the show where, uh, in the last episode, where you have Luther, the strongest one of all of them, uh, hugging her really tightly, effectively. And I was expecting, oh, this is the moment where he breaks her back. It was kind of what yeah. I was. This is the moment where he stops her powers because she's now crippled. But, uh, but you're right. There is a, also that touch of the of the gun. So again, you know, involving more of the characters and making it a, a better overall uh, storyline. I think. Uh, what they've done in the TV show. So I am enjoying the comics. I'm still going to finish them off, but I definitely say if you haven't read them yet, have, have a look at them, but it's not the same as the show. Uh, the show is. No, show no, is sorry. it's if you like the characters, if you like, if you like the characters, you'll see them in a different light. Exactly. Okay. I think yeah. that's the thing. Yeah. It's a different take. This is, this is essentially like for our Marvel fans, this is Marvel 616 universe and the ultimate universe. Yeah. Yeah. They're slightly different takes on the <laughs> characters that you kind of enjoy. Yeah. Um, the one thing I will say, it'd be interesting to see what they do with, um, if they pull up any of the Hotel Oblivion, which is the third graphic novel, which is 11 issues pulled into one, okay. I believe. Uh, whether they take any of that into season two. Mm-hmm. Um, and the final bit I just am curious is in the, <laughs> in the graphic novel Dallas, uh, number five goes back to save JFK. Yeah. In this TV show, it implies that he killed JFK. It implies that he didn't stop the death, wasn't it? That yeah. he, he yes. jumped, yeah. he jumped before f- fulfilling his mission on the grassy knoll of stop, of killing the person that was killing JFK. Yeah. And that's, I, I, that's yeah. a great touch in there because Absolutely. that's one of those things where there's a great, it's a great part of all of our collective mythos. How, who was it that killed JFK yeah. kind of thing? So, exactly. uh, was it really, um, Lee Harvey Oswald or was it the person on the grassy knoll because they found a place? So five was the one that was sitting on the grassy knoll and jumped out before anybody caught him. So, uh, and disappeared into time. I know you haven't read the comic books, John. So I don't, I know you don't have much to contribute to this section. No, let's go sadly on. not, but it's, it's yeah. interesting. I might dip into them as we have them on comicsology. Yeah. Um, but it, it's interesting that you're kind of saying maybe, Actually, the TV show has brought some added dimensions mm-hmm. to to the yeah. the story yeah. that uh, of of the comic, which yeah. is which is great because I think you know we we discussed this with um, the Marvel Netflix stuff where you know a lot of back and forth between um, you know the comics being inspiration for what's put on the screen, but it, it's nice when they both kind of work in harmony and there's a bit of yeah. uh, back and forth. Uh, so this, this adding to it sounds really yeah. uh, interesting. Netflix yeah. certainly okay. added a lot to the characters. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. 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 So gentlemen, we're coming to close to the end of our podcast. Um, I very quickly wanted to just discuss season two potentials. Mm. Um, there's a, I have a few here, but before I jump into it, would you guys have any, what would you want to see in season two? Take into account, uh, both of you have watched the trailer. I haven't seen the trailer. Great. Genuinely, I haven't watched the trailer for season two. I didn't actually want to watch the trailer because uh, we have been lucky enough. Our friends over on Netflix have given us season two to watch. Uh, so I've said I'm going to hold myself off watching it because we are lucky enough to be able to watch it directly after we record this podcast on season one. So I've been holding off watching it. Didn't want to spoil myself and also didn't want to spoil anything <laughs> about season two. Uh, if we were doing our speculation, I wanted to keep it to that point where we do our wonderful speculation that uh, that never comes true because we're terrible at speculation. So that's why I, I, I resisted watching the trailer. <laughs> well, uh, you'd be uh, glad to know there's not too much given away. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I watched the trailer because this is something, it's one that is close to me. I was like, yay, and we hadn't been told yet whether we'd be getting advanced copies. Mm-hmm. So I needed my fix. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm going to be, I, I would be very careful in what I say and what I don't say. Um, but then, on your case, what do you hope to see in season two? Um, I think for me, I definitely, you know, I want to see more of the dysfunctional family, even if it's that they're getting better, that, you know, that stuff lives long in the memory. So it's a long, difficult process. I want to, I want to see them argue, uh, be sort of, I, I, I kind of liked that. I liked how they work together, but not as one <laughs> in a, in a sense. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought that was really good. Um, I'm absolutely intrigued to to know what Vanya will do when she wakes up, um, because you know at the end of the day, um, 
she was fairly intent on what she was doing. And I just want to, what is the fallout of that with her siblings? Um, you know, it was a good, really good cliffhanger to that first season. And all they've done is transfer the problem somewhere else with the, the time travel. So is it, will she come around to forgiving them or is this where she becomes really just the problem child? And, um, it is kind of a big bat in a sense. This is their, um, I suppose, Hydra. Um, so I'm really interested on that. Um, I, but I, I, I don't know because I, I have no idea where that's going to go, whether they're going to continue to maybe tackle the apocalypse question with the company, mm-hmm. uh, sort of chasing them down. Um, and, and that I wouldn't mind because I just really enjoyed season one, but I, obviously they're going to develop, uh, it further. Um, so yeah, I, I think whether we delve a bit more into Reginald's, the, as I say, there was that slightly strange scene with the dying lady, presumably his wife, um, mm-hmm. and the va- violin that then Vanya was using. Uh, and all these rockets uh, leaving the the planet that they were on. Mm-hmm. So, I, you know, what planet was that? Um, the violin, you know, certainly that's the focus for um, Vanya's energy. So did this woman that uh, Reginald Hargreaves, uh, was it his wife, his mother, a friend, his, his lover, um, is, was she similarly blessed with this kind of power? Mm. And then just to see, are all the others actually blessed with as powerful um, a power as, as Vanya? It's just that they haven't actually known how to use it properly, like we saw with Klaus. Um, you know, Klaus was just getting to grips there with how he could use his, yeah. um, his power to commune with the dead um really well which was really cool so like there's there's tons here and you know will hazel live happily ever after in a a lakeside cabin being (laughs) fed donuts uh for breakfast lunch and dinner by agnes don't, Probably not. Don't imagine that's what's no. going to happen in the next season. Um, I'm really hopeful that they resolve this particular apocalypse question. It's a kind of a running gag in the comics anyway that uh, they fix the apocalypse all the time. That's that's what they do. It's what happens in every superhero comic. It's basically there's a coming ap- apocalypse, it's solved and fixed, and then they move on to the next apocalypse. So um, so I kind of want them to do that in the opening uh, couple of episodes. I think the, the challenge that they could hit is if they get into that uh, that terminator time travel loop thing where they always have to prevent this particular apocalypse from happening that could get kind of boring which is exactly what happened to the terminator franchise which was probably my favorite science fiction franchise but it just kept going back to the same points over and over again to solve the same exact apocalypse so they need to fix it i hope it's going to happen in the first two episodes and then something else is going to rise out of that uh, to lead us into a, a bigger season two. Um, but particularly what I'm looking forward to is seeing more of Ben and, and more of Klaus. Uh, what, what effect has this whole, uh, travel back to Vietnam? What's it had on, on Klaus? Will he be, uh, clean, uh, for the second season? Uh, or will his mouth be just as dirty as it was in the first season? <laughs> so, uh, so yes. So th- th- that's my little bits that I'm looking forward to for season two. Chris. Excellent. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you on all those points. Um, I'll kind of just give you my ones, which is, will number five get a name mm. by the end of the season? That would be a nice ending. Yeah, it is, it is a really interesting little uh, thing that's going on throughout the season that everybody else has a name, but it was that Hargreaves refused to count, to call anybody by their name. Um, and their mother gave each one of them a name and that, that's what happened, but, yeah. uh, but he refused to call them by it. So, uh, five has never had a name. He's always just gone by five the whole time. But remember, he's almost 60 now. So going by the name five for 60 years, will he be willing to change it from five? That's a question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm right with you on the powers. Mm-hmm. Um, well, like for me, I want to see the, the evolution of their powers. Yeah. Um, and also on powers, Alison's throat was cut. 
Yes, it was. Uh, in season one. That is true. Uh, mm-hmm. How can a person with potentially no voice tell a rumor? Yes, absolutely. Um, so that's one that's going to be interesting. Yeah, she's and then, writing yes, on her notepad, the, isn't she? Uh, at the, the moment, the, yeah. Yeah, at the end of the season, she's writing yeah. on a notepad. So maybe she becomes a newspaper reporter telling rumors that aren't actually true to the world, <laughs> convincing them that they... She is the the, <laughs> ev- the, the origin of fake yes, news? That's her, that's her new name. That's her real superhero name is Fake News. <laughs> 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 Uh, welcome to TV Podcast Industry, where we take topical comments and make light of them. <laughs> uh, the, the big one for me is Hargraves. Uh, and is he an alien? Is he not an alien? Um, what is the story mm-hmm. there? That was such, in the comic books, it is quite implied that he is an alien. Um, but this has makes, like, the fact it, it's kind of again implied here, where you see spaceships taking off. Um, but it's never directly stated if they, I don't want that to be a throwaway scene. Mm-hmm. I think it needs to have been in there for a reason. Absolutely. Um, there's this great tin foil hat theory where do you remember just as he looking out the window, mm-hmm. he opens the jar and these little fireflies come out. Oh, yeah, um, okay, yeah. And this, yeah. someone went in and counted, and apparently there's 43. Well, there you go. That would be, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. So apparently these these little fireflies may be responsible, or similar fireflies in a jar, mm-hmm. were responsible for the superpowers. So he is a time-traveling alien mm-hmm. who is aware of the coming apocalypse, and it was his job to see the superpowers to build an Avengers mm-hmm. in it. And that's interesting to see will they explain that yeah. will they look into that what's it going to be? all makes a lot of sense if you're able to count uh, 43 fireflies on your tv screen you have a uh, ultra high definition screen without a <laughs> doubt, uh, and a lot of time on your hands um but it would make total sense if there's 43 of them on there that's absolutely what caused the birth of uh, of the 43 children that's one of the things that i would like to see in in season two we had leopold here a kid born on the same day natural birth but wasn't powered at all uh didn't come from this uh this group of 43 kids but potentially there are a massive amount of stories with 36 other children out there around the world all born on the same day all possibly with superpowers or not so um so intriguing whether they'll lean into that in season two the discovery of who all those other children were but are they born. all dead now um well we don't know that's the, well they will they are dead definitely at the end of the series because yeah. everybody on earth is dead <laughs> but we know they time jumped so at least um, to that point yeah so uh so yeah. hopefully uh we'll get some uh, revelations as to who uh, those other kids might have been. Exactly. Because that feels like the main story. Like, that's the opening of our synopsis that was taken from the back of the comic book, and it's the voiceover at the beginning of the first season of Netflix. 43 children were born, only seven of them were found. And the instant question that pops into your head is, what happened to all the rest of them, you know? Uh, wh- where are they? So, Well, that's what I, I really hope for, too. That's my, like, because it's kind of explored in the comics kind of not um so for me if they they really want to double down that season two is a because yes you have the two you have the two creators are kind of helping with this show Mm -hmm. so i can very much see them going well look we have this thing we'll probably explore it in the comics but we're going to give it to you so go in and take this and giving you that do you know what Here's here's number nine. It'll be very interesting to see. So, gentlemen, we've come to the end of our season one recap. Mm-hmm. We have spoken about what we want in season two. We are a mere two weeks away from watching and finding out what actually happens in season two. Mm-hmm. But that is still so far away. So, for now, I do believe it is time for us to end and mainly just ask our fellow academy alumni to send in your thoughts what are you hoping to see in season two Mm -hmm. you can send it to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com or as i said earlier join us over on our facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tv podcast industries and tell us what do you want to see in season two Mm -hmm. who do you want to see more of who do you want to see less of Will Vanya become a big white violin? I hope not. Who knows? <laughs> Will you get even more tentacle porn from Ben? <laughs> Again, who knows? 
will they save the world or will there be another apocalypse? Mm. Who knows? Or will it be 10 episodes leading to the same apocalypse? That's, that's the one thing that keeps going through my head. I'm going, oh, please don't do the same. Don't do 10 I episodes like to the same idea. apocalypse. I they like that idea. They keep running through idea. the same thing. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Let's see. Well, so we now know which of you like Sarah O'Connor Chronicles mm-hmm. and which you didn't I like. I love Sarah, Sarah Connor Chronicles. Chronicles. I loved it. Uh, yeah. but, and okay. uh, the the Tom Cruise. Live, die, repeat. Live, yeah. die, repeat. Yeah. Now, that's a good one. That's yeah. a different take. But when you start getting into Terminator, Genesis, mm-hmm. Dark Fate, what was the, the latest one? That was Dark Fate, yeah. yeah. Okay. Which was the other Salvation. terrible one? Salvation. Yeah, Salvation. That's, uh, yeah. There you go, yeah. And Terminator 3. And that's where we start running uh, into a time-traveling problem. <laughs> Absolutely. But we're not here to talk about Terminator, are we? No. Uh, one thing I did want to say is if you want to hear your dulcet tones giving us your thoughts on this season one or... Any of your thoughts on season two? You can record a clip of yourself on your phone and email it to us, or you can go to our website at tvpodcastindustry.com and record up to 90 seconds of your thoughts each week as we record, and we'll make sure it's there. But also, you can leave it in the spoiler post that we will be putting up for each set of episodes that we'll be recording. Mm-hmm. We'd love to hear from all of our fellow Academy alumni. I, I, you don't want to hear me. Listen, come on. You've, you've heard me enough of me. You've heard enough of John and Derek. We want to hear you. <laughs> As we move into our 503rd episode, we just want to say thank you for joining us. We hope you say subscribe to the podcast. And if you enjoy what you hear, why not share it with your friends? Why not talk to your mother, your father, your chimpanzee, <laughs> your a robotic mother even, your robotic grandmother? Who knows? <laughs> just share the podcast with all of them. Because sharing the podcast is sharing the love. <laughs> But if you want to be extra special to us, why not head on over to patreon.com slash TV podcast industries, where just for a buck, a euro, a dime, a dollar, whatever your currency you are currently using, you can help us keep the lights on and the mics on. Well, not a dime. That's really lovely if you would like to donate a dime to us, but you can't do that on Patreon. It's the minimum oh. of a dollar. <laughs> so, oh, okay. But thanks very much uh, to all of our supporters over on Patreon. Again, we'll hopefully be releasing our uh, Umbrella Academy episodes earlier over on Patreon. If you follow us over on patreon.com slash TV podcast industry supporters for any amount over there, you'll get access to the episodes before they're available on our main feed on TV podcast industries.com. Thank you so much for joining us for this wrap up of Umbrella Academy season one. I wish we'd done this uh, last year that we'd done each of the episodes as it came out, but that's fine. I think we did a pretty comprehensive look back at the first season this time. Yes, but you've got a comprehensive look, an in-depth look here in this episode. Mm -hmm. So, Tara for now, we'll return on July 31st with our discussion of episode one of the Umbrella Academy season two. We'll discuss episodes one, and then over the weekend, we'll discuss episodes two and three. So that first weekend, you're going to get two bonus episodes, and then three episodes per week until the end of August, where, gentlemen, drum roll... We're going to get Stormfront. We're going to get Homelander. Yes, we'll be back covering the boys. We, Huey and I. And if you if you missed it, don't worry. I won't be doing accents in Umbrella Academy Season 2 that I'm aware of. But I will be doing a terrible Scottish accent, you know. <laughs> uh, when we cover the good boys grief. Season 2. Yay. More things for me to <laughs> edit out. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll talk to you again next time. Bye. Yeah, thank you so much, fellow Brolly Dollies, uh, for joining us. It's a pleasure speaking with you. Can't wait to have you on board uh, looking at Season 2 of The Umbrella Academy. Mm-hmm. Remember, keep watching, keep listening, and importantly, in this weather, keep dry. Nice. Uh, it's pouring out there, and you'll definitely need an umbrella. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Ella. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Number five. Left before they all got names, he was testing his teleportation powers and got stuck in the future after the world ended. Just, uh, I think your intonation on that was... What? Uh, number five left before. It sounded like he was left behind before he left before. Yeah. <laughs> I think I was fine, but nonetheless, let's go. <sighs>
<laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll fix it in post. Diva. <laughs> All right, script says it's a Jeepers. Now I know what Judy, good old Judy Dench, feels like. Can we just do one more take on that, John? <laughs> you're, you're perfect the first time, but just, just for quality. But yes, as we move into our 502nd episode, thank you so much. Okay, this is our 501. No, this is our 502. What's five, what was 5? Oh, the page out for one. Sorry. See, Chris. come on, that was the that's fine, but that wasn't really my fault. <laughs> no, we're, we're recording out of order. Look, here. this is this is time traveling with the Umbrella Academy, so uh, it's the one we're recording <laughs> in the future. <laughs> is our next episode. 